This is O'Reilly Media. We are at Oracle's Open World talking to Java innovators. And right now I'm talking to Pete Muir. He works for Red Hat. And could you tell us a little bit about what you do there? Sure, yeah. I um, originally worked for Red Hat on the Scene project. Uh, I started at Red Hat about four years ago and worked on Scene for about three years. Uh, we then moved on to work on CDI, which is Context and Dependency Injection, part of the Java Enterprise Edition 6 specification. Uh, more recently, I've been continuing to work on the CDI specification and working on InfiniSpan, which is an open source data grid and caching solution we have at, at JBoss at Red Hat. So let's just try to put some definition into this, because mm -hmm. I've actually heard the term CDI all over the place. Sure. What is it for people who don't know what it is? Okay, so CDI is really a way of wiring up your application. Um, we've seen lots of dependency injection frameworks before. We've had things like Spring, Juice, going back a bit, things like Pika Container. Um, in many ways, they address deficiencies in, in Java itself. Um, they allow you to invert control, make your code more unit testable by, rather than you know, creating the wirings yourself by calling out to a factory or calling out to an instantiating a class. Um, they allow you to inject things and therefore inject mock objects, etc. when you want to test. CDI is a little bit different. Uh, most DI frameworks in the past have concentrated on simply on the wiring aspect. But CDI took a step back and said, well, actually, we have lots of contextual information. Um, we have state that we store perhaps in the session, perhaps in the application scope. Let's make that a first class construct within the framework, within the specification, within the design, and al allow your DI to, to, to take advantage of that rather than sort of having to wire that in at a later date. So that's, that's for me is the big difference about CDI. So in terms of CDI, we just uh, spoke to Bob Lee, and he is a creative juice. Mm -hmm. uh, Rod Johnson is the creative spring. Yes. There's other dependency injection frameworks. Yep. Could you talk a little bit about what are the options that are out there, and what is the option that you use at Red Hat? Absolutely. Um, I think the main options that are out there in the Java world um, that people use today are CDI, which we've talked a little bit about, um, Juice, which is the, the Google framework, um, and Spring. Uh, they, and then the other thing we find with our customers is they, there's lots of people who roll their own framework. You know, they, they just have something in-house, the big guys, they have something in-house that they've created. So those I would think are the, the four that I would put in, into boxes. Um, now, what's the differences between them? Um, CDI is, I guess, the newest of them, and is, is really, um, how do I put this, sort of a, uh, a meshing, a melding of all, all, all three of them. So it draws a lot of influence from Juice. Um, that's probably, in, in many ways, one of its largest influences. Juice was the first one that was type safe, uh, fully type safe, so rather than using uh, strings and, and variable names to refer to other objects that were to be injected. It used the type um, and then an annotation, a Java annotation, to introduce extra information about what should be injected if you had multiple implementations of a type. Um, and Seam, which as I said is my background, that's where a lot of these ideas around context came from for, for CDI. Um, and of course, you know, CDI also drew on, on uh, you know, frameworks such as Spring. Um, Spring is, is one of these ones that uses uh, variables, uh, variable names, strings underneath to refer to things. So they have a, a type safe layer on top. Um, there were two specifications that really came about in the Java world. I think you know, often specifications come about when people say, right, look, as an industry, we've reached the point where we understand and have reached a rough consensus on where these things are going. We're at a point now where we can say, this is the way people should do stuff. And there were two, two uh, uh, specifications that came about in, in, in roughly in a quite a short time frame. One of them was JSR 330, which is the one that Bob led, um, which was the at inject specification. And this one's really focusing very much on, on the, the basics of injection. It defines the basic annotations you need to do injection and, and the basic behaviors of injection. And then CDI, which built on top of that to add this contextual support and added um, support for things like events, um, things like interceptors, aspect-orientated programming. Um, so adding much more loose coupling and ortho you know, the ability to introduce orthogonal concerns in. So, so I want to try to bring us back to develop some context for what CDI mm -hmm. means to people. Sure. I remember maybe 10 years ago, uh, maybe eight years ago, there was no such thing as Spring yet. Mm -hmm. It might have been around, but people weren't using it. Sure, absolutely. People were just creating uh, castles made of singletons, mm -hmm. very brittle, very difficult to test, yep. very difficult to use. Fast forward to today, there's a lot of people using Spring, mm -hmm. but what they're doing is they're really just creating 
the same castle of singletons, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. So talk to me a little bit about the disconnect between how people use dependency injection frameworks and how you conceive them to be useful. So I'm imagining sort of a specific system I have in my head where sure. there's a hundred objects and there's only one instance of those objects yes. and everything's captured in an application context.xml yeah. and it, you get to the point where it's just as brittle as the singleton solution. Yes. So talk a little bit about that sure. and, and maybe the disconnect between how you think people should use dependency injection and, yeah. and how it is yeah. actually used. So there was a big, I think, you know, part of the story is, you know, where Spring came from, right? Spring came from EJB2, which was, you know, and people's hatred of EJB2. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that it was a very heavyweight approach to doing this, um, it encouraged storing state, this wasn't scalable, and people wanted a solution that was scalable. And, and this is why, you know, Spring was created to try and solve this problem. And, you know, they focused very much on providing either completely stateless services or, you know, as you say, singleton-based services. Mm -hmm. And I, I, you know, completely understand why they did that. It was a very sensible way to go. It was, you know, a reaction to where we were. were. But, of course, in a lot of applications, there is some natural state. For example, if you have a user logged in, you naturally want to store them in the session. You know, that's a, a natural um, context in which things can be stored. So I think, you know, one of the things that we've moved towards as an industry over time is an understanding that state is useful in some circumstances. You know, over overuse of state is, is too much. And, you know, as you say, having everything stored as singletons is not, not the way to go. Not least because you end up having to introduce your own separation of the context and you end up manually doing a lot of work that the framework should be doing for you. Um, so, yeah, I, mean, I think, you know, that, that for me is sort of the way we things have gone. People have understood that storing too much state is bad, but also storing not enough state is bad. So try and store it where it, where it naturally makes sense for your application. Right. Okay, so this is my last question, mm -hmm. and I just want to know, what do you want programmers to take away from what you're going to be presenting? Really, uh, what I want programmers to take away is that, you know, that, that the most important thing for a programmer is to be productive, and that, you know, this is what we're working towards with, with CDI, with Java, Enterprise Edition, is to make developers productive, you know, uh, to, to be able to build applications quickly that perform well, and you know, to be able to t take the skills they use from building those applications and apply them elsewhere. And this is my second last question. Years ago, mm -hmm. I remember going to Java 1 and having to suffer through EJB presentations mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. thinking this is not productive. Yes, absolutely. How has it changed since then? And has it been affected by things like Rails? Yeah, absolutely, yes, completely. Um, how has it changed since then? If you sat through an EJB2 presentation, what we do today with Java and Transition has nothing to do with EJB2 at all. Um, you know, without wanting to blow Red Hat's trumpet, we've been very involved in trying to bring the focus back to what developers want, developers being productive. Um, you know, to be honest, nowadays, if you don't want to use EJB, lots of people don't want to use EJB, they see it as a, a dirty word. You don't have to. You can write your application completely without a Java Enterprise Edition, without uh, EJBs in it. You asked about Rails. Again, yes, I think everyone's taken a lot of lessons from, from what the Rails guys have done. Convention over configuration, rapid application development tools. Um, we're starting a very exciting project at, at, at JBoss called Forge. Um, it's you know similar tool to Rails, rapidly scaffold your application, you know, really pluggable, allow pe other people to come in and write plugins for this, this tool so that they can generate applications in Java as well. Okay, great. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Good luck. Thank you.